writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host, David Allen Lucas, author of science fiction and mystery and horror. And with me today is... Kathleen Kayembe, writer of Paranormal Romance under the pen name Kaseka and Vita, an all-around strange person. Brad R. Cook. Uh, I am an author of uh, mostly steampunk novels at the moment, but let's hope that changes soon. Uh, but definitely check out Iron Horseman, and uh, Iron Zulu is coming later this year. Yay! Yay. I'm Melanie Claney, writer of science fiction, uh, fantasy, and nonfiction. Fedora Amos. I write Victorian whodunits, and I am president of Greater St. Louis Sisters in Crime. Excellent. And today our topic is points of view. When we sit down to write a story, in fiction anyway, um, it's always a question of what point of view do you write from? Is there a point of view that is set to a certain genre? And what are some other fun points of view that you might have ever tried or that you've read? Finally, let me throw on one thing out there. Can you write from a point of view of something in which you are not? Writing is the other? Writing as the other. And with that, well, there are some thoughts out there. So let's start off with, what point of view do you find you normally write from? Oh, wait a minute. Could we start yeah. by defining, just in Good case idea. we have people, you know, what is point of view? What are the different types of point of view? So what is point of view? Point of view is, as a writer, who you're having narrate the story. So there are different kinds of points of view. There are different ways of narrating the story. Uh, There is first, second, and third person, so the basic Uh terms. First person is I. You, if you are the camera, the camera is your your main character's face. Through the eyes. Mm -hmm. Through the eyes. But also, you're you're in the main character's head, or you're in the character's head, and you hear the main character without... You know their Without thoughts. dialogue is I. saying I. Yeah, that's the whole point of through the eyes. You are literally in the head of the person who is telling the story. Right. Yep. So let's jump to the next one, which is the second, next point easy, second. second point of view. Second point of view is from your perspective. Yes. You. You go to the mall. You see a dress that you like. You wish you had money, but unfortunately, your boss did not pay you yesterday because he was out sick. And I hope you can see the problem with that. Yes. Because... Yeah. You have thousands and thousands of views, and it gets to be really tiresome really fast. So it takes, I think, a very special kind of writer to make that work. You shove your hair out of your face. You wish you had gotten it washed yesterday, but unfortunately, you had no shower because the power was off, and so was the water. There's a lot of telling in you. Your hair was brown. There's a lot of telling in you. You works better in, like, uh, textbooks or very short explanations. Choose your own adventures comes to mind. Yeah, that's, that was where it might work in fiction. Right. Make your Facebook post in second person. Right. Yeah. <laughs> now, third person? And there's multiple yes. third person. Third oh, person. and um, stories with uh, orders, like, you do this. Um, third person is generally... Either omniscient, uh, omniscient. Sorry. Well, let's talk or about over the shoulder. Let's talk about limited and omniscient later, because you can actually have first person omniscient and first person limited also. So, what would you like to do to explain third person? Third person is when you're out of everybody's head. Yeah. Okay. It's the you know fairy or the camera that's floating above everybody, you know, and gets that view of everything and gets the view of overarching. And then the difference, real quick, is you can go. In everybody's head, and that's omniscient, or you can stay completely out of everybody's head, and that's kind of your more standard third person. Or you can go over the shoulder of one character. That's called third person limited. Yes, It's like first person, but it's not eyes. Yeah. And one thing you can do with it is also... I think you miss internalization on that. Yeah. Like when you're when you're doing the third person limited, I, I think the one biggest issue is you get no internalization. You only get the outward expression of what we feel inside. So that's the only thing only I find if limiting. You're, only if you're third person 
objective, not subjective. Well, I meant limited, third person limited. I'm talking about okay. limited. But you but in every variety of these things, you can have it be objective, that is just the facts, ma'am kind of stuff, or you can have what you were talking about, emotional content. So which is the subjective version of the same thing. So an objective example would be his face flushed, his ears turned red. I hate all of you, he said, and stormed off. And that would be, we're guessing he's angry, but it doesn't say it. And subjective would be, his face flushed, he couldn't stand these people. He stormed off. Yes, no? Eh. Explain better. <laughs> Explain better. I'm trying to understand. Well, the objective form is used for something like true crime, mm -hmm. where you let other people decide what is meant by anything and everything. And you just give the facts. You find that kind of thing in essays, for example, especially erudite essays, where the facts are the things that are listed and the data that prove those facts, and the conclusions are left to other people. It's not used all that often in fiction. It is sometimes, however, with true crime, mostly, I'd say. Hmm. And some magazine articles. Yeah, I'm going to pause for a second because we have had yet one of our other members join us. Oh, hi, I'm Matt. You've heard me before. Hey, Matt. Uh, yeah. um, one of the things, and this also crosses all the points of view which you just talked about, is the, is the unreliable narrator point of view, too, where you know they're lying or you get the sense they're not quite telling the truth. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to point out, I mentioned it briefly, but if you're like, even if you're in first person, not many writers do this, but I have read especially some uh, historical novels that do this. You have first person omniscient. So basically, I'm today. If you try to do Which this, might be someone. Uh, well, that's what I was just saying. I'm, hello, I am God. Yes. Let me tell, let me walk this world. And I'm going to tell you what this other person thinks. Answer. If you actually want to do it today, you'd almost have to be, have your character either be psychic or God. But in the past, it's almost like they were changed. They didn't really care about those little things called points of view consistency, and uh, they were oh. first person in saying I, and then yeah. they were. They were projecting emotions onto other people and all sorts that of things. That is seriously true for classic novels. Yeah. Right. I was actually going to ask about that because one of the first questions that David asked was what our favorite points of view are to write in. And I was going to bring up that it has changed over the years. And I think uh, Fedora and Brad would know more about that than I do. Well, let me throw out my favorite novel. One of my favorite novels that I have read many, many times, which is uh, Alexander Dumas's uh, The Three Musketeers. Sorry, okay. I'm doing a, a, a classic, doing a classic, okay. classic, you know, tale from literature that I'm sure everyone knows the story because you've all seen the thousand movies that have been done. But anyway, the actual book, when you read it, is told not from a single point of view. And I mean that in the sense of you sometimes are D'Artagnan and you are walking through the book as D'Artagnan. You spend most of your time as D'Artagnan. However, when D'Artagnan first appears, there is an entire break that happens which is now a complete third-person point of view, omniscient kind of thing, of how D'Artagnan got to Paris. Getting the horse, getting all this other kind of stuff, it's all told like this. Then he'll be going along, you'll meet a character. He will go into an entire backstory for that character. It's almost like you just read the footnotes <laughs> that are included in the text. And it makes for a super thick book that is hard to get through. But at the same time... At the end of it, you not only know everything that your character would have known, you know, D'Artagnan going through this thing, but now you know what each of the other, th you know, three, you know, uh, musketeers were thinking. You know what the bad guys were thinking half the time. You see them in, in scenes that obviously, you know, your heroes aren't in. It's a wonderful way of telling a story. I don't know if you could do it today, but Dumas did it beautifully. I'll get an answer to that question in a second. I'm going to let Fedorov go first. Some people do do it very well today. In, mm -hmm. okay. in fact, one of the greatest writers of our century, Gabriel Marquez. What I can't think of. Uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. There we mm -hmm. go. Hundred Years of Solitude. This book is mammoth in its in its everything. It is magical realism, and I think if you were going to attempt something like this, you need this vast amount of stuff and epic that is perhaps many generations long, as that one is or encompasses magic realism, or something otherworldly, because there is so much more that he wants to tell yes. than just this family saga. 
it is a story of a made up town called what Macombo, something, something like, like that. that. Yeah, and it's a town of mirrors because Marquez is holding this idea, this mirror, it's a town of mirrors, which he's holding up to people in Latin America especially, and saying here, you keep making the same mistakes and it's your own damn fault time after time after time can't you see this? And that's one of the reasons why it's such a great book, because Mm -hmm. it takes this vast mass of stuff and makes it so real that it's comprehensible to anybody who cared to read it. It was a very typical way of writing in the later part of the 1800s. And it's been carried through by some people. But if you read Moby hard. Dick, and very if you hard. read uh, you know, some of the big epics like War and Peace, or some of the others, they are all told in that style. It was a very, very popular style. Does it change depending on what language you're in? Because I thought um, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez was a Spanish yeah. speaking mm-hmm. author yes. and wrote in Spanish. But it's been translated to uh, mm-hmm. anything oh. you could name. And what was Three Musketeers written in originally? French. 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 Yeah. So, I mean... Well, let, well, let me throw out a modern... Unfortunately, he's passed away now, but he's still a modern author, Robert B., Robert B. Parker. He wrote in one of the Spencer for Hire novels, the one the one's called Six Killer. Most of, the, most of the novel follows Spencer. It's written first person, just like many of the hard-boiled detectives. But then we would go into the past of this other character named Six Killer, who is very much important to the story, and now you go into a third person point of view, and it's a whole separate chapter. Now, I will say that changing points of view like that Mm -hmm. is a good way to help the reader keep track of where you are. You know, you're in first person for this part of the story, then when it goes into third person, like, oh, we're in the other scene, we're from the other point of view now. And if there were two first persons, it might be harder to keep those separate. Well, we'll talk about that later, but you were talking about, about... Taste changing and tastes do change, yep. and requirements do change. For example, you'll find a lot of Dickens that is written for serials, and he had quotas for these stories, mm-hmm. and they had to be X number of words. So he'd throw in extra stuff that didn't really have to be there if it were going to be as bare bones as a modern one is, because people have less truck with that these days. We don't want all this extra stuff. We want to get to the nitty gritty. So tastes have changed and also publishing has changed and those of course Mm -hmm. will make big differences in your point of view. Yeah, Another one that did that was Dumas who we just mentioned a little while ago. And exactly. And also the fact our knowledge and information and our ability to travel have changed so much that some of that stuff's now taken out. Um, Jane Austen used to put a lot of, in a lot of her time period, Oh, and the crystal uh, crystal was this, and the food was that, and back then that's how they that's because people were. I don't want to use the word stagnant, but I can't think. Well, of no, I afraid. I actually They're read stuck. an I read an annotated one, and anyway. a lot of those details to the people of the day uh-huh. would have been indications of class and things that go right over our heads. <laughs> I back to, um, back to points of view. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was just. Um, I would like to remind us all to touch on the unreliable narrator, but mm-hmm. first, um, I'm thinking about Harry Potter, mm-hmm. and I have been told actually that he's an unreliable narrator, and everyone's an unreliable narrator, and I should get into that later. I said I would, um, but I was thinking about one of the books in which Harry does not have all the information he needs for the reader to have all the information they need. So Rowling put in a first chapter, or um, close to the first. Yeah, that's um, in the Ministry of Magic, something Harry has no access to and is not there for at all. And the Minister of Magic is doing this thing that's important to, to know for Harry's story. But Harry Potter is told from over Harry's shoulder, third person limited. And I was wondering how do the conventions of point of view and narration that we have now make it difficult to tell stories like that where the main character isn't privy to all the information the reader needs. Well, first, with third, with the third person limited, there are sort of two varieties of that. There is third person close, in which you travel around with just one person. Mm-hmm. But third person limited is what, say, romance writers often use, because they want to tell the story from the heroine's point of view and the hero's. And so they use just those two. 
And uh, a, a rule of thumb that I read somewhere is that once you get past four or perhaps five, you get to too many of these limited yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I limited that narrators. Because I was so reading a be book. So be careful with that. I was reading a book. They kept switching the third person close to the narrator point of view. I was like, I wanted to get back to the... He's like, just enough to make me care about that character. Then it's on to a different character. Like, when are we going to get back to that other character? Okay, this character's a string. Now there's a third one. Now there's a fourth one. Wait a minute. What's going on here? Are you talking about Game of Thrones? Because no. Because that's one that I can think of that has <laughs> so many narrators. But the stories don't all interlock quite... So it's like jumping from one story to another at times between narrators. You know what helps with that point of perspective, though, uh, is the genealogy chart that's in the back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I would also say there that, especially on Game of Thrones, there's a difference between the book and the TV show. Mm -hmm. And the TV show is more jumpy than the books. And I say that only in the sense of there are things in the books that did not make it into the TV show hmm. um, where you get to see some of these journeys that you didn't get to see on the TV show. So there, you know, and, and anytime you get into a giant ensemble cast, it's a worry. I totally will agree with that. True. Yeah. What? But you know, technically Stark and snow and people like that are supposed to be your anchor characters mm -hmm. that the other mm -hmm. stories are supposed to come around, but he's deviates just slightly from that. Well, I usually do <laughs> third person close, following just my protagonist, Jemima McBussell. Sometimes I do <laughs> third person limited, which has two, is the most characters I've tried to do, but one includes, of course, my regular protagonist. This is Jemima McBussell, and the other one is Frank Butler, the husband of Annie Oakley. This is in my book that's coming out in 16. I'll be doing some shameless, oh, you know, promotion and here. And <laughs> it's told then from his point of view. And I alternate chapters. Well, I don't exactly alternate them, but I have chapters that are devoted to both so that I can follow only one at a time. And uh, that is called Mayhem at Buffalo Bills Wild West. And it's coming out from Five Star in 2016. Yay. There we go. Nice. I have... Two projects, one that I took a break from and one I'm working on now. First, the one I got, took a break on, it's third person limited, but I stay from one point of view of the character until that character dies, then I jump to another. Well, no. I actually started out, my first idea was to always be from the point of view of the captain, and I was having fun by breaking con sci-fi conventions and killing off the captain. Mm. So, like, oh, okay, five points of view. But then I decided I needed something to tie the story together. So uh, there's a murder that takes place. You know, the captains. And uh, <laughs> so I have the, um, the security detail that's investigating that. So we keep coming back to them. So they're kind of like the story that ties through all the others. <laughs> well, because they're not here, I'm going to throw out their names anyway. Uh... And, you know, give some shout-outs. But in terms of multiple points of view books, uh, Meredith Tate, who you will hear here regularly, her new novel, Missing Pieces, is actually told mostly from two characters going back and forth. So one chapter will be about one character. The next chapter will be about the next character. And then T.W. Finley, who uh, has appeared here a few times, uh, her book, Zero Time, is uh, written not only in different points of view, but those points of view are also spaced out across time. So thousands of years and they all weave together, which is kind of crazy. So if you are looking for multiple points of view books, those are definitely some. Not mine. I tell it from one point of view. It's Alexander. You're in his brain uh, the whole time. So I've got a multiple. It's called Love and Wrath, and the cover is interesting. There you go. Um, but that is also a romance. And as Fedora was saying, with those kinds of things, you want to be able to tell the story and get the emotions of both of the well, both or however many of the characters are involved in that romance as the romantic leads. So let's, I'm going to throw out this question to everybody. Is there, do you have a preferred point of view, first, second, third, that you prefer to write in, or is it something that's dictated by what you write? And add to that and read in. Okay, and read in. Well, I'll say this. Eileen Dreyer says that point of view is all about intensity. And so the first thing that you need to think about, I believe, when you're deciding upon a point of view is how intense you want the sucker to be. 
If you're going to do a thriller, for example, a lot of those, as Dave pointed out already, are in first person. Why are they in first person? Why? Because How the killer is anybody. Is media. We're going to uh-huh. die. <laughs> and so that creates a Feel lot of excitement. Journey. Yeah. Uh-huh. So uh, we can go through each one, I think, and talk about what it's most suited for, what it's best suited for. Any other ideas you have about what first person is best suited for? Well, I was going to bring up genres and what Mm -hmm. they have to do with points of view. I would say that one of my favorite genres to read, (laughs) urban fantasy, um, paranormal investigation, has first person point of view all the times. It's always first person point of view and you're in the head of a badass woman who is fighting supernatural things and solving mystery. That is what is always there. What it is might the name be of that book? Over the shoulder. Oh no, it's like a genre oh, okay, thing. I see. Like uh-huh. if it's a paranormal investigation, you're usually first person or third person close limited over the shoulder. Well, it's just you with you, you the just said main investigator. you just said female and and I, I can think of one that was male, so I was thinking you were talking about a specific one. Oh no. Um Urban Fantasy right now has a lot of female yeah. narrators like that. Like badass woman, strong female character. Use that in quotes. Shout out to Angie Fox. But yes, yeah. very much so. So it's a thing. So right now I read a lot of um, first person and third person over the shoulder of that genre. Uh-huh. And I'm not sure if it's different for other genres. I'm pretty sure it probably is for like things like history, though. A Historical. lot of thrillers, as we said a moment ago, thrillers and hard-boiled, hard, hard, especially hard-boiled detectives, are usually first person. They're mm-hmm. not all. John Lutz definitely is not first person, as an example. But the reason for it is we're looking at the world through that character's point of view, and reliable or not, we're, the intensity, to borrow Fedora, is everything's happening to them, and they're having to break through all of it. Beyond that, it's happening to the reader. Exactly. Because the reader instantly puts themselves in that eye. That eye isn't the character there. The eye becomes you. Exactly. And you begin to experience these novels, and that's one of the reasons why I, I think mm-hmm. I has taken over. First person has kind of taken over as a really dominant force in the... And probably the why second person isn't used too much, because first person is actually more effective to get that effect than yeah, so second person. Another, another one I'm going to throw out there, another <laughs> genre, is adventure in the sense of like what Brad wrote is where you want to follow one person's journey and that one person only. And if you really want to get it personal, first person. Also, I think it works for someone like Ivanov- Ivanovich, who does mm-hmm. humorous mystery. And uh, we, of course, follow along mm-hmm. with Stephanie Plum and all of her various problems. But, of course, it has a drawback, as every point of view does, and we can talk about some of those drawbacks, too, with... Uh, with the Stephanie Plum books, eventually the joke gets to be the same joke every time and can be, in a less skillful writer's hands, a bit cloying. Yes. Hmm. You? Uh, well, I was thinking, uh, so first person, one of the things it's good at is getting in close with a particular person, experiencing things through them. Uh, I was wondering, does anybody, does anybody know any examples of like a book where there's first person perspective only, but there's multiple first person perspectives? Yes. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, yeah, friend. No. Um, there is a book. It is um, oh now my, now the name of the book just left my brain. No, but I will tell you what it was about. It is about a con- it is historical. Uh, it is about a Confederate regiment who is stuck behind Union lines after the surrender, hmm. and they're f- trying to get back home. And every chapter is a certain is a different point of view. Also, too, there is a novella. Uh, As I Lay Dying by Faulkner, where that is written from multiple points of view, and it's always back and forth. Each chapter is its mm-hmm. own point of view. And the shortest one was My Mother's Now a Fish. So so that kind of, well, that's one of those things where the strength of it is that you get in close to the person, mm-hmm. but it kind of contradicts it because you're splitting your attention between a bunch of people. I think with those, you have to be careful that your narrators are equally interesting. There was an Eric Larson book called Devil in the White City that I liked. It was about um, Chicago World's Fair and how the fair was being set up, built. And that was the one, not not point of view necessarily, but that was the one narrative thread that we were following. And it was also following a second H.H. Holmes 
serial killer mm -hmm. setting up his own kind of fair Most of fair. horrors, yeah. a hotel of horrors, where he killed people. We don't know the number of people he killed because he did it so effectively. So the H.H. H. Holmes story was much more riveting to me than the World's Fair story. So if you're going to do two narrators, you have to make sure the reader doesn't want to skip one of them because you've mm -hmm. made the other one so fascinating. Yeah, I was uh, the, I don't remember if this was first person or third person, Larry, I think it was Larry Nevin, The Intercold Tree. That was actually the book that I was thinking of that they kept flipping to a different characters, like when you're going to get back, you know, when are you going to tie these together, when you're going to get back to the original story, whatever. And I didn't even finish that one because I got so frustrated, like, okay. <laughs> um, do you, you want to follow up on that? Oh, no, go, go for it. Because this is different. Oh, uh, mine was different too, so it's cool. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be different separately. Oh, and they yes. went over the mic. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that, that you need to be careful when choosing a first-person uh, narrator to make sure that you don't necessarily choose the protagonist, even, but choose someone who does have a stake in things. And I'm thinking about Nick Carraway in The Great Gatsby mm -hmm. uh -huh. as, while he does not understand Gatsby, and we don't either. He is just so far out of our kin of all of the strange things that he does. But that is his fascination, or that's why we're fascinated with him. And if he, we were in his head and Fitzgerald started telling all of the little details in that, I think it would have been a pretty dull book. It's much yeah. better from Nick Carraway's point of view. So Gatsby it can be a be secondary bad. character, mm -hmm. not the protagonist at all. Sherlock Holmes. It was from Dr. Watson's yes. point of view. Yep. yep. I think that dovetails very nicely into what I was going to ask, oh, actually. Good. My question was, how do you choose your narrator and point of view type, and what are the benefits and drawbacks of the different types of points of view that you would go through as a writer trying to choose? This actually is uh, very much involved in the story I'm writing now, mm -hmm. and as I'm writing the rough draft, I keep flipping between third person, limited, uh, no, sorry, no, third person close, and first person. And as you read through the rough draft, you can see very clearly how I'm flipping back and forth. Then the issue is, um, I think I want the book to be for first person, but right now my point of view is from my main character, and there might be some scenes that are critical that she doesn't have any bel business belonging in, you know, she doesn't belong in. And so my choice, if I make it third person, I'll make it third person, because I need to have a scene or two that isn't from her point of view. Yeah, I think that's something that's important about first person. I like writing in it a lot, but uh, you have to be comfortable, I think, with an incomplete picture at some points. You have to be okay with some sense of, well, okay, my character doesn't know about this, whatever. I'll just have to let it be mysterious. And the story will have to either work without it or you'll have to find some other solution for it. Yeah, it's amazing when you're reading first person, it's like, Boy, that kid gets everywhere, you know? Yeah, it and you can. have to be careful about that. Uh -huh. Exactly. That can get a little... But it helps mean, build in mystery. Yeah. True. You know, because you don't get to see everything. Stuff does happen off screen. Can we try an exercise? Mm -hmm. I want to go through what the benefits and drawbacks are of these different points of view types, and I think it might be useful to use Little Red Riding Hood or another fairy tale mm -hmm. as an example of the story we're trying to tell and why we would choose certain points of view to tell that story. It kind of goes back to an uncompleted answer question earlier, mm -hmm. was what's your favorite point of view and why, and is it dictated by your genre? Mm -hmm. So, which we only got through a couple of genres, so. So, if we were telling Little Red Riding Hood in first person, what kind of story would it end up being? You wouldn't see anything of the wolf. So you wouldn't know what the wolf was doing at any particular time. Unless it was time. from the wolf's point of view. Unless you did the wolf's point of view. Which the wolf might be is interesting. there in each seen, except for the one at the very beginning where the mother's like, don't go off the path, here's your basket. Yeah, but I mean like he, you'll see him as the as Red Riding Hood sees him. Which is sort of like, you know, realizing like at the end, you know, mm -hmm. when he's the grandma, you know, she'll, you'll realize with her that it's the wolf. So it's better to be Little Red Riding Hood's point of view for first person? It would be more of a horror story then, I guess. Okay. Um, yeah, what? it would be a different story. It, it would be... It would be almost Dexter if it was from the wolf's point of view. About the grandmas. Could that she would be, be a... hard because she's not there till the final scene. Okay. Well, you could write it from... If you wrote it from Grandma's point of view, you have her waiting for a red riding yeah. hood and up comes a wolf. 
And then you get that suspense going on. Yeah. Once upon a time, there was a girl named Little Red Riding Hood. I don't think it's just coincidence that practically every uh, fairy tale you ever came across was written in third person. Right. Third person uh, omniscient. Yeah. Omniscient. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah, because then it's more like a little uh, diorama if you see it from that perspective. Because then you have, you know, you see the wolf moving over here, little girl moving over here, grandma's over here for a little bit, and then she gets eaten. You don't get a whole lot of information about the characters inner lives in that kind of story, though. That's true. You lose that. Like, you can okay. say that... But it's supposed okay. to be universal, so it's okay to lose that, I right. think. Right. In, in that case, yeah. Okay. So, then, if we were using third person, would we be... Well, that's third person omniscient. That's what it's told in. Mm-hmm. But, like, if I were going to make it an urban fantasy story, the wolf would probably be a werewolf, and I would be telling it over Red Riding Hood's shoulder, and she would be a badass. <laughs> Or you could do it first person with alternating chapters between the badass and the werewolf. Or the werewolf, for example. if we're making it a romance, is the person who she eventually <laughs> falls in love with. So it's from both of their perspectives, the and he's misunderstood. The wolf is the woodsman. He, oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking the alternating first person perspectives. That would be like the romance of murderer and murderee. So, does the wolf kill the grandmother because she's secretly secretly an evil witch and we just don't know that? Is the mother sending Red Riding Hood off to die? As a sacrifice. Mm. sacrifice And the wolf is like, seriously though, where are you going, kid? I've seen this before. (laughs) (laughs) I think think you'd have to do that. I think think we have left the path. (laughs) (laughs) Alright, are we going to get back to the episode and find it's been eaten by a wolf? I think so. Oh, speaking of the episode, uh, something we wanted to talk about, I remember, was unreliable narrators. Yes. I think uh, the best form for that is first person. Just because, uh, you know, you have the person, uh-huh. like, telling you the story, theoretically. And yeah. so they they have more opportunity to lie there than Or maybe else. their information is incomplete or wrong. Mm-hmm. And I agree with what you're about to say, but then I can also th- I'm gonna throw out there, does the person, does the character have to be identified? Beyond the eye, that Ooh. also makes it on. That also makes it an unreliable character. Yeah, that mm-hmm. I I don't remember the story, but I was reading it. Like you were in somebody's head, it was I. The narrator was I, and the narrator was clearly one of these characters, but it was unclear which character. You were in the like you were in the killer's head, but you didn't know whose head you were in. Hmm, that seems like it'd be really difficult. I forget that what book really it was. Hard to do. Yeah, well, first person's hard to write. Sometimes. I think if you want to write social commentary or to lambast society, for example, as Mark Twain did in Huckleberry Finn, that uh, while Huckleberry Finn to us is not an unreliable <laughs> narrator, he sees things in a way that nobody else at the time did, which you might call an unreliable one, but certainly it's really through Twain's own eyes. But he would have been lambasted and probably his book banned more than it was if he had done it in a more traditional kind of narrator way. So, Kathleen, you said that uh, when you were talking about talking about unreliable narrator, that Harry Potter was an unreliable narrator. Why, why is he considered unreliable? Well, oh, he is. What Very I had clearly. been told, what I had understood unreliable narrators to be was a narrator who's telling you lies knowingly. Mm-hmm. And what I have been told is an unreliable narrator is not just that, but a narrator who is telling you things that are not true, regardless of whether they know this. So, in that sense, it seems that every narrator would be unreliable, because everybody is lied to, and everybody gets bad information through what they see sometimes. They misinterpret. Yeah, so I'm not sure now what an unreliable narrator is. I think there is more than one definition of an unreliable narrator. There's the there's the narrator that lies to you, then there's the one that's wrong, so you're led down the garden path with him. But, like, how much how much lying or how much getting things wrong does one have to experience as a reader through this narrator for them to become unreliable? Because something that is true about Harry Potter and is true about all the narrators that I read for the vast majority, anyway, is they're trying to tell you what they think is the truth. Mm-hmm. When they're seeing things, what you're seeing is generally okay. It's reliable. And to think of them as unreliable is weird to me. Yeah, um, a friend of ours 
and I'm not going to say who because I'm blank. I, I think it was Jamie, but I don't remember. But she was trying to write. She's. I think she's moved on to another project, although I'm not sure. But she had this idea for a book where people were losing their memories. Mm -hmm. So her point of view character was losing her memory. So she'd do something and then forget why she did it. Oh, man, Memento's great for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Memento is a great, unreliable narrator story. Yeah. It's a movie. Well, Not the book that we were talking about. Since we're throwing them out there, uh, how much does Hollywood and video games, more importantly, uh, affect point of view in writing stories now as novels? Because a typical thing in video games, and it's almost become cliche, is amnesia. Where you start out at the beginning of the video game and your character doesn't know anything, has forgotten everything, so that you're forced to relearn it as you play the video game. Uh, movies now come from, you know, most of them tend to be in a third person omniscient kind of form mm -hmm. where you will see both the good guy and the bad guy and you'll see scenes that don't involve anybody from the main story. Maybe it's some little side plot thing going on or something like that too thugs meeting and exchanging something. Nobody was there for that. Nobody saw that, but it's good visual, so we put it up. Um, and I'm wondering how much of that, those two mediums are going to affect the way we tell books in the future. I think they already have affected how we... Oh, I'm sure they have. Um, third person, anyone? <laughs> First person, anyone? We're following these characters, and we're seeing and experiencing their lives primarily. And I think having a camera do that is... Uh, yeah, most Probably movies are third person, well, third person limited, yeah. type, uh, close or broad, but they're third person limited, you're not in people's heads. I think that's well, because the... first person's too shaky. Because <laughs> they the... tried that in Doom and a few and other Blair movies Witch. where they suddenly go in and, yeah, you Blair Witch and some of these others. They still do found footage, though, and yeah. I guess that is the first person perspective of yeah. movies. Because it's like, it has it has all the things from the first person writing. It has the immediacy. It has the uh, incompleteness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah, that's it. Of course, I they guess. do third person that close more than first person. <laughs> yeah, I was actually going to bring up screenwriting too in relation to that. How does it change as a screenwriter when you're writing for a character who the audience is seeing through it the eyes of? Depends if you're writing for a movie or a play. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is, if you're writing a movie, it's very much about scenes. It's very much about the visualness of it. So you're writing a story, but you're almost telling that story in visual and then adding words to it. Um, if you're writing a play, then generally all of your stuff is going to be contained within one room, one scene, one something. And then it's about creating, you know, who's the main character and who are the characters that affect that character. Um, so it's a little bit more traditional, I'd say, when you're playwriting. Um, you're just limited in the sense of, you know, they can't jump in a car and go off unless you want to have that, you know, get in a car and have the car on stage. You know, you're limited those kinds of ways. Uh, and so point of view can switch that way. But um, when you're writing dialogue and everything like that, I guess, it, I guess the easiest way to say it, it's very much in third person when you write a script. However because you're putting yourself in all of that it, it almost feels more like a first person of each individual character who's on stage but movies are different movies is about creating a visual impact and then putting words with that i was thinking about second person again uh second person the reader is your main character in a lot of video games and in um zombies run the app for exercise that's a radio show mm. you the app user are the main character and that seems i hadn't realized that we use second person like that oh yeah it just mm -hmm. clicked sorry guys i was having a moment that's pretty much the only place that second person in my opinion works for fiction very well as a video game or no i mean as in uh choose your own adventure make your own adventure type things yeah, uh, I was actually thinking about second person. It's kind of the like redheaded stepchild of points of view. Mm -hmm. Does anybody here like writing it? Uh, like, I guess not predominantly. That's not going to happen. But like, <laughs> in any significant amount, I never do. Yeah. No, I have not. Not a significant amount. No. Often Just... on Facebook posts or like weird little blurbs like that, because I'll be like, you know, you need to see this or something crazy like that. But hmm. you know. Yeah, in terms of other writing, in terms of my actual writing, no. I, I'm a first person. I used to be third person pretty much exclusively, and I really like the internalization of first person. Uh -huh. I like getting into the emotion side, and not only getting to feel the emotion of the character, but the interpretation of the emotions that are coming at that character. Are we discouraged from using third person omniscient now? 
Uh, in practice, yes. In theory, I don't know. <laughs> Depends upon the genre. Yeah. Yeah. Each genre has kind of certain POVs that favor, or they favor, I would suppose. So if you're going for marketability, or if you're trying to be like the other books on the shelf, then obviously you're going to want to write towards that. Um, but if you're writing, you know, I only say that like if you take like you know, epic fantasy tends to be written in third person. Um, you know, uh, Lord of the Rings. Exactly. Whereas, you know, as we were talking about earlier, murder mysteries tend to be written in a first person for that detective mm-hmm. going through and solving the case or whatever. Um, so, you know, and but here's the benefit and the beauty part of this industry. You can always write different. So you can always write that other point of view and that genre be different. Write that breakout novel that everyone flips out for, i.e. Sherlock Holmes isn't t- told from Sherlock, it's told from Watson. I think this is a good time to bring up the stories that we were talking about before the episode started, David. Stories with different kinds of narrators. Well, I'm going to let Fedora go first. She's been waiting. and then. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to say that uh, certainly in the past, the most common point of view has been third in some version or another. And I think it is still exceptionally good point of view for doing Mm -hmm. any number of kinds of things, particularly from my own point of view. The uh, puzzle type of murder mystery, because it allows you to have a good subplot going, as well as your main plot. And I think we are moving toward more and more first person, as what readers seem to want more of these days is more and more of the intensity, the kind that Eileen Dreyer was talking about in the thrillers that she writes. Gives you more and more intensity. So match what you're trying to do, how detached you want to be or not to be with what your point of view you select. YA and New Adult are almost exclusively first person. They are indeed. And, but that, of course, has its own set of problems because it can get quite tiresome. Mm-hmm. It can really That's because what I said. You can always same, write different. Yeah. yeah, you can always write the other point of view and they break this, out from the rest. Because you get the same emotions time after yes. time, and there are only so many different words you can use for that, and it gets tiresome. I read one fairly frequently by someone I'm not going <laughs> <laughs> to mention. <laughs> that, that happened to me. Yeah. No. Then you have tricks. Actually, there's yeah. a great book for that. It's called The Emotional Thesaurus. Yes. I have it. It is a wonderful, wonderful piece of literature. <laughs> there's also um, yeah, online you can, yeah you can find them online as well it, the site is still up though they've changed sites and they're still continuing work on it but there's emotional information is what Brad just said and there's other things the bookshelf muse I believe is the name of it if you google it you'll find it um, ok back to Kathleen's question are there other points of view you've written from other people's point of view Odd points of view that you've written from. Not that I've written from. Or that you've read. That you've but enjoyed. Uh, that I have read and actually enjoyed too. And it's <laughs> an epistolary. Mm-hmm. And this you yes. don't find very often. But it is in some, a very popular book fairly recently out. The Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Society. And it's all done in letters. World War II era. Oh. That are from a lot of different people. And eventually, of course, what works its way around to a wonderful kind of point and a, and a charming sort of story. It's very funny, and it's not a story at all. It's epistolary. It's a bunch of letters. And yeah. so it's quite delightful. I, I read another book. It was about uh, couples getting divorced, and it was all written communications. It wasn't just letters. It was letters and emails, um, but in text messages occasionally, hmm, I there's think. There's been movies, tons of movies done like this, mm-hmm. tons of books yeah. done like this. We even have... Uh, Peter Green, who's uh, used it in his books. Yeah, it's been done back to at least Dracula. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I totally forgot what I was going to say, so go ahead, Kathleen. Perks of Being a Wallflower is a series of letters, and um, there are also diaries like Dear Mr. Henshaw, mm-hmm. way back when. All right, I remember now. So points mm-hmm. of view from other people. Uh-huh. Uh, well, I, I have written stories from a female point of view. That That's definitely uh-huh. one thing, but uh, I have actually, and you as well, Dave, we've both written stories from the points of view of cats. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Um, you know, so I, I think it's possible uh, to do, and it's very easy to do if you put yourself, if you can put yourself there in that place, and then go from there. I think you could write as anything. Yes. Well, my cat is not Skittles and is not <laughs> doesn't do half the stuff Skittles does. I have to admit, observing Skitt- observing <laughs> my cat Pumpkin is definitely a good source. Exactly. One of my favorite series I've started reading just recently um, is a Private Eye series. 
It's called the A Chet and Bernie Mystery Series by Spencer Quinn. And it is written from the privatized dog's point of view. It is hilarious. It's cute. But it's well written. And well done. And I think actually it helped me go ahead and do Skittles. Yeah, and I don't remember the author, but the Mrs. Murphy series. Mrs. Murphy uh. is a cat. Mm-hmm. And the cat and the sidekick, who's another animal, I don't remember what time, if it was a dog or another cat, I think another cat, go around and solve mysteries. Mm. So let me ask you guys this. I'm going to paraphrase it. It's really so, still the same question. I'm going to just twist it a little bit. Um, recently, we went, uh, Melanie and I went to BoucherCon. And there, there was a author who I can't think of the name. I can see his face. It doesn't help us any. But he was talking about, they were talking about multicultural. And he said, and he writes a Chinese female lesbian he goes, yeah, you can tell I really represent that. And he, he was joking, saying, you know, he's writing from a completely different point of view as a white male, <laughs> older man. So is there anything that like that, that you, like other cultures you've written from? or? Well, one thing that I think is a very popular book that <laughs> oh, sorry. was written from someone who was not a geisha, was Memoirs of a Geisha. Yeah. yeah. And uh, people were surprised it was a white male American, American, British? White male author. Some Manglosphere dude. <laughs> <laughs> Manglosphere. Oh my goodness. Whatever it is. Wow. Uh, well, talking about that and writing other cultures and stuff, uh, in my next novel, Iron Zulu, it's coming out later this year, um, I it, obviously I'm writing about the Zulu. So I have, you know, one, done extensive research. But beyond that, I've had a love of the Zulu for a number of years now. I could go into why, but there's a ton of reasons. Um but And that's why I chose the Zulu over in the other tribes. I'm most familiar with them. Um, but because of that, I've done a ton of research uh, and, you know, found a ton of things, you know. And I'm trying to make it very authentic, but at the same time, I'm not trying to make it stereotypical. I'm not trying, you know. I'm trying to avoid a lot that could be seen as stereotypical, it could be seen as culturally insensitive or any of these other, you know, kind of factors that could play in. And I feel in doing that, beyond all of that, I'm really writing about a character, uh, you know, a boy, technically, he's a teenager, um, who's, you know, a part of this culture. So at the same time, I'm trying to honor all of that, but, you know, pull back and make certain I'm writing a well-rounded person beyond anything, because that's the most important. That sounds like the way to write someone whose point of view is different from your own, period. Make them a well-rounded character. Yeah. Um, because in that way, you do honor the the person that you're writing and their different cultural influences but you also honor the story um i was thinking about message characters again <laughs> yeah i hate them so much um i've been watching a lot of the trope versus women in video games videos and by feminist frequency online and being horrified at the the things that I see, not just in the videos, but that the videos help me recognize in other parts of culture, like in uh, anything. If there's a female character, they're probably a token, or there's a couple of them, but there are less females than male characters in an ensemble cast. And if someone's going to get kidnapped or do something stupid that nearly gets them killed, it's probably going to be one (laughs) of the women. Why? Because there's no good reason. So, um... See, I get to flip a lot of that. I love flipping all of that, so... Uh, in this story, the character that actually is going to get captured is the male, uh, and he's going to have to get rescued. Uh, so look forward to that kind of funness. But oh my you know, so there, there's a lot of that kind of funness that I like to throw into books too, just so I can avoid message characters, stereotypes, stereotypes. cliches, yeah. all of that kind of fun stuff. That is you know. one of the benefits when everybody else gets predictable. That's uh, your chance to go the other way. Exactly. Well, you were asking different points of view for the science fiction novel. Mm-hmm. Um, I had the hardest time figuring out the point of view mm-hmm. because what I consider the main character, I realized I couldn't make her my point of view character because she knew too much. If you were in her head, it would either be incredibly difficult to write because she's supposed to come across as schizophrenic. Mm-hmm. So that would either be in- incredibly hard for me to write, you know, the unreliable narrator to not just confuse the audience, is she crazy or is this this conspiracy real and all that? 
or you, the, write, the reader would know everything and there wouldn't be all that suspense and I couldn't build things up, so I had to make it from somebody else's point of view. <laughs> uh, well, actually, you just made me think of a uh, mystery writer who's a Japanese fellow and he writes like a... They're called like light novels. They're very like thin... Novellas? Short. Yeah, they're novellas, basically. And, uh... I was thinking of the second book in the series, he writes one where, like, it's a first-person story, you know, and the protagonist there, like, he knows way more than he shows you for most of the book. Yeah. It's actually, I just thought, it's impressive that he, like, he managed to get through most of it with this character, like, appearing to be normal, but also hiding this big yeah. secret behind him. So it's possible to do that kind yeah. of thing. It's just particular. Is that an unreliable narrator? Because yeah, be he's bad. definitely unreliable. Okay. Yeah, my problem is it would be just hiding things for the sake of hiding things because all of her actions aren't supposed to make sense to the outside world, but they make sense to her because everything she thinks, but then you'd either think she was too... The, the ambiguity is gone if it's from her point of view. You either think she's crazy or you think that every the reader knows about the conspiracy and all that. Okay, here's a fun one. POV that I kind of love to throw out. Who is the main point of view character? And there's a great argument can be made for this online of Star Wars. And everyone loves to throw out that Luke Skywalker, and then when the movies got completed, it was, no, 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 it was Anakin Skywalker's journey. But there is actually a case to be made that it is (laughs) R2-D2. That the entirety of Star Wars is told from the point of view of, you know, R2-D2. And the reality is, is that when you go through it, yes, there are scenes he doesn't appear in and all that, you know, it's a movie, so we jump around a lot. But when you really get down to it, yeah, when you really get down to it, and technically he doesn't show up until Naboo, uh, you know, they fly off and escape Naboo, but there is there is a case to be made that R2-D2, and especially if you take A New Hope, Empire, and Return of the Jedi, mm-hmm. um, that R2-D2 is the one telling that story. I love the translation video. <laughs> oh, God, R2-D2's yes. R2-D2's yes. beeps and lurks. Yes. R2. I feel useless. You really are. <laughs> R2 is a smart mouth. <laughs> I think that one thing that we definitely need to do is address the issue of what are the big problems that some people have with point of view and the reasons why various editors and agents are going to reject them on oh, the yeah. count of yes. point of view. And I have a little article, which was from the Writer's Digest by Steve Amon. Steve Amon is a former professor of uh, creative writing at Boston College, and this is what he said, are the reasons why point of view can get you kicked off of somebody's read list. One, head hopping. Two, the speaker has nothing at stake. Three, the character couldn't possibly know the things that he's given mm-hmm. to know. Yeah. So, I'm going to turn it over to Brad, who's going to tell us all about those. <laughs> or one of them, at least. So what were they again? Okay, head hopping. Okay, head hopping is a good hopping. one. That's a really okay. funny one. So, we've, we've talked about this, but head hopping is truly, you can have character jumps from one chapter to another chapter. That is a beautiful thing to do. We've thrown out a number of books that do that. But if you do that in the same scene, so... You know, it's a gunfight, and you get into this guy's head, and he shoots the gun. Then you jump over to this guy's head, and he shoots that guy. And he's thinking, oh, gosh, now I'm scared. i got to shoot that. If you do that in a single scene, that is the most annoying thing to read. By the way, romances do that, and they seem to get published anyway. That's well, romances. you know, there are, there are tropes. Stuff. We could do that with every one of these. What was the next one? Then, are we through with that one? Or are we through oh, with well, that we can keep me? going on no, that no, jump. No, no, I was okay, just going right. to kind of... The next one is but you the speaker... the path of the bullets? <laughs> no, no, you're jumping from people's heads, so it's like, this guy's scared, and then you jump over here, and this guy shoots. Oh, no, I'm scared here. No. Could you and tell then you him? got the guy who's like, I'm running out, I'm going to kill everybody. You know. But to to avoid that, and yes. as, as it's often done in romance, what do people do? Stick to one character and tell, like, and okay, so you, yes. you, you know, the, everything over here is going crazy, and then weird crazy guy over here runs out and wants to kill everybody um, and do all that kind of fun stuff. So you can have that. That's, you know, first person, and then you just see what everyone else is doing. And there's a whole thing, and a lot of, you know, young writers do this or, you know, people who are starting out because they want to tell you what everyone's doing and what everyone's thinking, what everybody's feeling in the story. But if you pull back from that, you can tell a much better and cohesive story that is way easier to read. And uh, if you do change point of view, say within a chapter, yeah. you need to have an investment for the reader 
in the characters that are, you're talking to. They have to know and like or at least understand something yep. about those characters or they won't care who's thinking what. Yep. Right. So you have to make them care, first of all, and you can't do it too often or it gets really, really old. Yeah. But definitely, you know, try and make it just one chapter. As you say, you can do a chapter break or something. But definitely the point of view character is the one, maybe not with the most at stake in the story, but it's it's the person who's best at going to tell that story. Uh, and that should be your point of view character, i.e., you can have a Nick Carraway tell your story. Because Nick can show you an outside opinion of all the craziness that he's seeing as opposed to jumping to Gatsby's head, then jumping to Daisy's head, then jumping over to, you know, so-and-so's head. Um, so, it, you know, don't do the Skippy thing. That's bad. What's the next one? <laughs> the second one is the speaker has nothing at stake. Oh, the speaker has nothing at stake. And we were just talking about that a little bit. So, you know, Nick Carraway is a great example of this because initially he comes in with nothing at stake. It's really just, oh, I get to go to this great party that I'm living next to. But through that, Suddenly he gets wrapped up in this world. You know, Gatsby's technically the one with the most at stake, but if we were in Gatsby's head, we'd know everything. You know, Nick is the one who's invested in this friendship, but is it a friendship? Is it good? Is it bad? What is this? You know, he's invested over here because these are the rich people that have, you know, kind of helped him through his life and stuff like that. So it's a good example of he has a good investment in all sides of the story. Um, and you need that because the point of view character is there is the one that carries the reader through the book and definitely you need that person to be the one who's not necessarily the most invested in anything but the one who can you know get you to that end, you know show you all the sides of that investment um, in the story because that's what it's about is telling this whole story as you go through to the bottom anyone else having that on that well, That's you were good. talking about Watson, and of course yeah. Watson has a lot at stake because uh -huh. he rooms mm -hmm. with Sherlock Holmes, uh -huh. and he's the, the, the muscle, he's the gunman exactly. who has yeah. to go out and back him up. So he has a lot at stake, and I think that's a very important aspect. Yeah, no, you do, especially for a point also, of view character. He's also Sherlock's friend. I think that's interesting to think about for Nick Carraway, too. He was a friend. He was yes. close enough to get most of the story and to experience most of the story, but far enough away that he didn't know what was going on a lot of the time. And, and so he's the reader experiences cousin, it with him. Yes. Distant, yeah. so he has an investment on that side yeah, exactly. as well. That is very important. And those people are just as weird. Yeah, he <laughs> bridges is. both sides of the waterway. You know, he's both in East Egg and he's over in, I can't remember the West other. Egg. West Egg. Thank you. <laughs> East Egg and West Egg. So, yeah, he bridges both, which is why he's the perfect character to tell that story. And he's poor and both of them are rich, mm -hmm. but one nouveau rich. Yep. So, yes. Okay. Anything else on uh, no, I think having fine. something at stake? Then number three. And number three is that the character couldn't possibly know yes. what the character is given to know, like uh, whether somebody that they just met has a tattoo of someone named Shirley on their yeah. shoulder. <laughs> well, okay. there's there's two there's two versions of that. One is worse than the other. The first version is they know stuff they couldn't know. You know, they know the guy wearing long sleeves has it that they just met has a tattoo on his arm. But the other is. Like, why is this person here? It makes no sense. Why was this little kid invest, uh, invited into this, you know, uh, classified meeting, you know? I have well, a third one. Be... And why did this character do X, Y, Z, which will fix things when they wouldn't know about X, Y, Z being able to fix things? Yeah. There's that. But uh, another good one is, you know, things happen, you know, off camera, so to say, uh, but the character knows about them. Mm -hmm. And this happens a lot in first person, where you will want to say something about your bad guy, but your main character wasn't there to see that. Um, and, you know, for me, that that's that's the fun part of writing first person, is to try and figure out a way to take what... I, and I just actually went through this. This is really weird. So I wanted to inject some some information into my book, into a scene in my book, but they didn't really... They weren't really there. They can't do anything. So in that moment of gasping of where there's this real revelation I want to go into because it's a big revelation in the book... But in that moment, I have a conversation taking place. So I get to put that conversation in there. They're there for it. They get to hear it. But at the same time, that's just a little side thing happening over here. The real part is this whole emotional thing that's taking place. But I still got to put it in there because it's kind of going on in the background. But it was, it was a really tricky way of trying to slip that in there. So oh, yeah. the next you haven't said no, much no, today. No, I'm just sitting back huh? and enjoying. What's that? I'm playing Kevin 
Was there another one, or was that <laughs> it? Well, actually, no, that you have more pet right. peeves you want to air? <laughs> pet peeves on point of view. That's player knowledge, not character knowledge. Yes, yeah. exactly. You're not the DM. Mm-hmm. No. <laughs> and for non-gamers, that means just because you, the author, know it doesn't mean the character whose point of view you're telling yeah, exactly. the story from knows it. Exactly. You can't do that. And yeah, sometimes that's really hard at a first point first person point of view. Yeah, that's the other thing is if it's a first person point of view, why are they explaining this? So okay, they're not Yes, it's explain it can be such an info dump. Oh, there's yeah. a pet peeve. Yeah, yes. it's like why the okay. info dumps are That's first why you person. need Watson. <laughs> yes. You need someone it'd be better to put it in a scene. Have uh, someone from the outside come in so they can explain this versus just happening to think this, you know. Yeah. Uh-huh. I think for a narrator you need a certain amount of fish out of water in them so that the reader can see through their eyes and get to know the world while they do. But that's led to the cliche, you know, amnesia in video games thing, where, like, every mm-hmm. video game, there you have amnesia. And then well, you have to get it back so that you can learn and level up and all this stuff. That's a oh, video yeah. game thing because they need a way for the player to learn how to use the control system. Yeah, they need but better POVs in for, video games. For uh. writing purposes, for writing stories. It's hard to get, if you have an expert point of view character, a mm-hmm. point of view character that's an expert in the world... They need that uh, sidekick that they're telling, they're showing the ropes to, because you know there's no reason for them to just think about, oh yes, this is the way magic works in the world. You can't do that because of this, but you know you can teach your apprentice that stuff. Then you know that makes sense. Butcher does a really good job of that. Yeah. Yes, but again, he has an apprentice. You know, he he explains it to other people, and the little parts in the head are just little snippets. Like you know, he mentions in passing, he actually has a fairy godmother. You know. oh, we didn't talk about Dune and the great internal point of view, <laughs> where literally the entire story is taking place internally in the head through inner monologue. Yes, yes. love Dune. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, should we last minute Rex then? Because we need to close up shop. That is what I would say. Is I think that sounds like maybe another episode. And I will tell you after this talk. Dune is its own episode. Yeah, we're, <laughs> yes. The spice will flow. The spice must flow. <laughs> um, but I think also, too, we're going to have an episode on, specifically, the unreliable narrator. So, to our fans and audience out there, hopefully you have a great writing week, and tune in for next week for yet another interesting topic in the writing of The new theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her. The Right Pack would like to thank STL Books for allowing us to record in their bookstore. STL Books and Gifts is St. Louis's newest independent bookstore with an emphasis on fine literature for adults and children and the most comprehensive selection of St. Louis books available anywhere. Visit them online at stlbooks.com or in person at 100 West Jefferson Avenue, Kirkwood, Missouri, 63122. Tune in next week as the Right Pack will conquer yet another pondering issue in the writing industry.